Ancient Egypt is a land of great wonder. Some of the most astounding architectural achievements in human history can be found within its borders. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt engineered colossal construction projects, building many monuments, statues and temples in their own name and in the names of their gods. A large number of these monuments have withstood the test of time and can still be seen today, thousands of years after being constructed. If you've ever dreamed of exploring ancient Egypt, longed to follow in the footsteps of the pharaohs, or imagined the desert sun setting over the Emerald Nile, you're ready to step aboard a Nile River cruise. For over 5,000 years, the Nile has been the lifeblood of Egypt, and there's simply no better way to experience that wealth of Egyptian history, culture and architecture than on a Nile River cruise. The Nile is a wonder in its own right, the wellspring of civilization in ancient Egypt and northern Africa for the last 10,000 years. In a desert region where it only rains a few times a year, the Nile is the only consistent source of water to sustain the necessities of civilization such as agriculture and drinking water. The Nile River is the longest in the world at 6,695 kilometers. For good reason, most of the great cities and wonders in ancient Egypt and neighboring Sudan were built along its banks. Let's start our journey at perhaps the most famous of these ancient wonders, the Pyramids of Giza. The Giza Plateau is the northern extension of the necropolis of Memphis on the west bank of the Nile and is today among the suburbs of modern Cairo. When visiting the Giza pyramids for the first time, you anticipate the experience of standing before these magnificent structures rising out of the desert sands in a kind of time warp. The Giza plateau is famous for three pyramids. Khufu's son, Khafre, constructed a pyramid next to his father's monument. From a distance, Khafre's pyramid looks higher than Khufu's, but this illusion is due to the structure's sight on rising ground. The third pyramid belongs to Menkure and is the smallest of the three. When they were built, they were encased in thousands of blocks of white limestone from the Tura quarries across the river and must have presented an imposing sight, shining from a great distance in the scorching sunlight of the desert. Now, most of the casing stones have gone, stolen in ancient times, but some can still be seen on the apex of Khafre's pyramid. To date, archaeologists have found 118 pyramids in Egypt, but the most perfect and biggest of them all is that built by Khufu, a ruler from the 4th dynasty, 2600 to 2487 BC. Known as the Great Pyramid, the 147 meter structure is the first of the seven ancient wonders of the world and the only one still standing. More than 4,500 years ago, about 100,000 workers painstakingly stacked up 2 million limestone blocks over 20 years to create a pyramid with a precise 51 degrees slope on four sides. Quarried from an area southeast of the pyramid and transported over a ramp to the construction site. To the north of Khafre's Valley Temple lies the Great Sphinx, in its own enclosure. It is currently thought to have been modelled during Khafre's reign and would have been the first colossal statue in ancient Egypt. Fashioned from an outcrop of limestone left behind from the quarrying of stone of the Great Pyramid, the Sphinx crouches in a rectangular ditch bounded by Khafre's causeway to the south. It is a colossal crouching lion with a human head thought to be carved with the features of Khafre, though this is the subject of some debate. The body of the Sphinx, almost 60 meters long and 20 meters high, was carved from alternate soft and hard layers of sediments and marly limestone laid down during the formation of the Giza Plateau in the geological Isun period. Before leaving Cairo and heading down river, 
it is worth visiting the oldest pyramid in the world, the Steppe Pyramid at Saqqara. Saqqara is the location of the principal necropolis of ancient Memphis, dating from the time of the foundation of the city. The site covers 9,000 hectares, crowded with burials that span much of the whole period of Egyptian antiquity. A quick flight to Luxor Airport, and we're soon on our way, cruising down the Nile. Before we depart, however, we need to visit three sites of great importance, Karnak Temple, Luxor Temple, and the Colossi of Memnon. At the foothills of the Valley of the Kings, the Colossi of Memnon are two massive stone statues of Pharaoh Amenhotep III. Standing at 18 meters or 60 feet tall and weighing 1,000 tons, they are an impressive sight. For the past 3,400 years, they have stood in the Thebes necropolis, across the Nile from the city of Luxor. Thebes was the capital of New Kingdom Egypt. Karnak is the biggest temple complex in the world, covering an area of 100 hectares, and there is nowhere more impressive to the first-time visitor. Much of it was restored during the last century, and our knowledge of the buildings here in different periods of Egyptian history increases every year. In ancient times, Karnak was known as Ipet Isut, the most select of places. The temples are built along two axes, east-west and north-south, with the original Middle Kingdom shrine built on a mound in the center of what is now called the Temple of Amun. An avenue of ram-headed sphinxes leads the visitor towards the entrance. The sphinxes are fantastic beasts with the body of a lion and the head of a ram, a symbol of the god Amun. Through the entrance is the famous hypostyle hall. Standing among its 134 gigantic columns, the visitor can't help but be inspired by the grandeur of the place. The centre 12 columns are larger, at 21 metres tall, and have open papyrus capitals which may have been intended to symbolise the original mound of creation. The other 122 columns are 15 metres tall and have closed capitals, perhaps representing the swamp that surrounded the mound. The hyperstyle hall was begun by Amenhotep III, who built the side walls which close off the space between the second and third pylons. It was not completed until the reign of Seti I, who carved his beautiful raised reliefs around the walls of the northern half. His son, Ramesses II, completed the decoration of the southern half of the walls and pillars, often overcarving his father's reliefs with his own crude sunk relief carvings. Following a paved path along the side of the central court, the visitor comes to a building known as the Festival Temple of Tuthmosi III, anciently called Most Splendid of Monuments. The pillars inside the hall are said to imitate the ancient tent poles of a pavilion, unique in Egyptian architecture, and still show good remains of the coloured decoration. Moving west, past the shrine of the God's Wives of Amun, we come to the open-air museum, which houses various blocks and reconstructed shrines found in other parts of Karnak. French archaeologists have spent the past few years rebuilding the chapel from the available blocks, a very difficult task due to the original construction techniques. On the other side of the Temple of Amun, to the south, the visitor comes to the Sacred Lake, the area in the foreground was originally a fowl yard, and the domesticated birds belonging to Ammon were driven from here through a stone tunnel to the lake each day. Karnak can be a confusing place. Its buildings span a long period in Egyptian history. Most visitors on guided tours have very little time to see much of the temple, and many visits are needed to get even a brief idea of the temple as a whole. Join us in part two, when we'll explore the magnificent Luxor Temple, Esna Temple, Edfu Temple, Komombo, Kitchener Island, and the Island Temple of Philae.
The earliest remains found at Luxor Temple date to the 8th dynasty. Unusually, the temple does not face the river, but its main access faces Karnak, with the remains of an avenue of sphinxes pointing to the processional way. This remaining 200-meter avenue of human-headed sphinxes was erected by Nekat Nebo I. The modern entrance to the temple is to the west, and after descending the new stone steps, the visitor faces the massive pylon. From the Greek word meaning gate, a pylon is a monumental entrance wall to a temple. A gateway in the form of a pair of truncated pyramids serving as the entrance to the temple. This one at Luxor Temple is 21 meters high, which was a later addition by Ramesses II. Six statues of Ramesses stood here before, but only three remain, with one of the original pair of tall obelisks. Ramesses' great court features a colonnade around each of its sides, interspaced with colossal statues, many of which the king usurped from Amenhotep III. When entering the colonnade of Amenhotep, you may notice a slight change in the access of the earlier part of the temple. This colonnade, with its 14 tall papyrus columns, was unfinished at Amenhotep's death, and its decoration only completed during the reign of Tutankhamun. The colonnade leads into the elegant columned court of Amenhotep III, with ship shrines of Mut and Khonsu at its southern end. Beyond the portico on the south side of the court is a room which was transformed into a cult chapel of the Roman legion based at Luxor during the 3rd century AD. A niche-shaped shrine is now a modern entrance to a small offering hall or vestibule with pharaonic scenes of sacrifices and offerings to the gods. Leaving Luxor behind, we're soon cruising down the Nile. Our next stop is Esna. Esna Temple dates back to the Ptolemaic and Roman period, and one of the last temples built in Egypt stands today in its excavation pit, nine meters below the modern ground level. It was dedicated to the god Knum, Esna Temple would once have been built to a plan similar to the temples of Edfu and Dendera, but all that now remains is the hyperstyle hall built by the Roman Emperor Claudius, who extended earlier buildings. The oldest part of the structure seen today is the west, or the back wall, which would have been the facade of the original temple. The part of the temple we see today is around a quarter of the size of the original building. The roof of the hypostyle hall is still intact, supported by 24 columns, each with varied floral capitals. They are decorated with texts describing the religious festivals of the town and several Roman emperors before the gods. The temple facade is constructed in the style of the period, with the usual screen walls inset with columns. The reliefs show the Roman emperors, named by their cartouches, before many of the upper Egyptian deities. After passing through Esna Lok, we soon cruise further down the Nile, and we arrive at Edfu. Of all the temple remains in Egypt, the temple of Horus at Edfu is the best preserved, and the only one we know to have been completed. Until recently, visitors approached the temple past its massive enclosure wall on the western side, carved with figures of the Ptolemaic kings making offerings to various deities. Carvings on the massive twin towers of the 36-metre-high entrance pylon are almost mirror images of each other, with the traditional scenes of the king smiting his enemies before Horus. Ahead is the main temple facade, in front of which stands the famous colossal black granite statue of Horus as a falcon, wearing the double crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. Inside, the first thing to strike the visitor is the almost deafening twittering of birds up in the roof. This is the outer hypostyle hall, or proneos, with 18 tall carved columns to support a ceiling decorated with astronomical figures representing the sky. The inner chambers of Edfu Temple are similar to Dendera. The ceiling is supported by 12 slender columns. This hypostyle has a number of chambers leading off to each side, including two chambers of offerings, 
and a laboratory with texts describing recipes for incense, ointments and other temple necessities. And then we come to the Holy of Holies, the most sacred area of the temple. The sanctuary contains the oldest object in the temple, a granite naos shrine, which would have contained the cult statue with cartouches of Nectanebu II of the 30th dynasty. Moving on from Edfu, we travel to Kom Ombo. Kom Ombo temple is very unusual. It was dedicated to two triads of deities, each with their own associated chambers and sanctuaries. On the eastern side of the temple, the crocodile god Sobek, Suchus or Seth, is honoured with his wife, who is here named as Hathor, and their son, Konsu. The main entrance pylon has been destroyed, but entering through a portal at the southeast, the visitor comes into a large court with remains of a Roman columned portico, which still has good colour on some walls. In the centre of the court stands the base of an altar with granite basins on either side, which may have been used to catch ritual libations. The first hypostyle hall, behind typical Ptolemaic pillars and screen walls, has ornate floral columns with well-preserved ritual scenes on the walls. Ptolemy VIII, Neos Dionysos, is shown on the right making offerings to four mythical beasts. With only one more temple to see on our journey, we decide to pay a visit to Kitchener Island. An oval-shaped island in the Nile at Aswan was given to Lord Horatio Kitchener in the 1890s for his part in the Sudanese campaigns while he was the Egyptian proconsul. Kitchener, who was a keen gardener, turned his island home into a botanical garden, importing exotic plants and trees which flourished in the Aswan climate. The botanical garden was constructed in 1899 under the supervision of the Ministry of Irrigation. The visitor to Kitchener's island today will find a peaceful paradise full of shady trees, beautiful flowers and unusual plants among the paved walkways. The island is a haven for rare exotic birds of many kinds and their colourful plumage can be glimpsed in the branches of most of the trees. It is the perfect place for an afternoon stroll or a little contemplation during an otherwise hectic holiday. We leave the colourful Kitchener Island and head south to the last stop on our Egyptian tour, the Temple of Isis on Philae. A short trip in a motorboat will bring the visitor suddenly to a magnificent vista of the island before landing at what would have been the ancient quay on the south side. The earliest of the surviving monuments of Philae is the kiosk of Nectenabu I of the 30th dynasty. Most of the other structures are Ptolemaic and Roman and were reused by the early Christians when the temples were finally closed by the Emperor Justinian in 550 AD. The main temple is dedicated to Isis and was the centre of the cult of Isis and Hathor during the Roman period. It was the last pagan temple in use in Egypt. Beginning at the south of the island, Nectanebu's structure is a hall with screen walls linked by graceful columns. There are two colonnades on the east and west sides of the courtyard leading to the first temple pylon. The first pylon was built by Ptolemy XII and decorated in traditional Egyptian style with reliefs of the king subduing his enemies and worshipping the goddess Isis. Leaving the main temple by a doorway in the eastern side, you can visit the small temple of Hathor built by Ptolemy VI and VII with its Ptolemaic papyrus columns. This is currently undergoing restoration. Egypt has been known as the cradle of civilization for centuries and also as the cradle of inspiration, the source of many discoveries and experiences. Whether it's a desert adventure or the unfolding of history that interests you, Egypt will be the destination that sparks a burst of inspiration in your heart and mind. A great story awaits you on the banks of the Nile.